Welcome uh, everyone to the webinar series on COVID-19 vaccine. This is a jointly organized webinar by the Malaysian Society of Infection Control and Infectious Diseases and the Institute for Clinical Research, NIH. I am Professor Amu Radhakrishnan. I'm a professor of immunology at the Jeffrey Chia School of Medicine and Health Sciences, Monash University, Malaysia. For your information, uh, this uh, session is being live streamed for five social media platforms. And thank you for joining us. Now, I'm sure at the end of this session, you will have questions. So for question and answer sessions, like usual, please type your questions in the Slido app. We will try to address as many questions as possible. Uh, as this is a medical education session, please be reminded we will only address questions that are related to this topic. We will not address any policy related question, uh, which is beyond the scope of this webinar. Now all frontliners, health professionals and allied health teams, please remember to collect your CPD points by filling up the online attendance form. In case you've missed it, we will broadcast this again after the Q&A session. Please double check your email address before submitting. Now, after the webinar, the presenter slides will be made available on all our social media websites and email newsletters. Just for your information, this is the third season of the COVID-19 webinar series. So we would like to hear your feedback. So please take part in our survey on the healthcare providers, evaluation of the weekly webinar series on COVID-19 for continuing medical education or CME. We will send you a research participation certificate upon completion. The details are on the social media and we'll also share the instructions at the end of the webinar. If you would like to re-watch this session, you can go to our clinical updates in COVID-19 YouTube channel or listen on our podcast channel when it is available. So let's start our seminar. This afternoon, we are indeed honored and privileged to have three panelists with us. Dr. Tang Min Moon, a consultant dermatologist at the Kuala Lumpur Hospital. Dr. Su Kok Fung, an emergency medicine physician in Sungai Buloh Hospital. And Dr. Mohammad Faisal Bakhtiar, a physician scientist working in Allergy and Immunology Research Center, IMR, to discuss a very important topic, which is allergy and anaphylaxis concerns about COVID-19 vaccines. On behalf of the organizers, MySID and the Institute for Clinical Research, NIH, I would like to thank our panelists, Dr. Tang, Dr. Su, and Dr. Faisal for taking the time to join us this afternoon. So our first speaker, Dr. Tang Min Moon, is a consultant dermatologist in Kuala Lumpur Hospital. Dr. Tang has more than 13 years of experience in the dermatology field. She also had a fellowship training in National Skin Center, Singapore and Bern University Hospital, Bern, Switzerland. Her area of special interests are drug allergy, immunobullous disease and contact dermatitis. So without further ado, I would invite Dr. Tang to share her presentation. Thank you, Paul Amo, for the kind introductions. A very good afternoon to all my fellow colleagues and thank you for joining us today. All right, now I share my screen. Okay, we as healthcare professionals are at the front line of vaccine provision and are often responsible for recommending and administering vaccines. We also need to manage those seeking medical advice for symptoms after the vaccination. In this short presentation, I would like to share some allergy concern about COVID-19 vaccines. The COVID pandemic has not only changed our life, but forced every one of us, especially the medical personnel, to learn really, really fast. Right from the understanding of the coronavirus to the clinical manifestation, treatment modalities, and the COVID-19 vaccine, 
new information is coming our way every day. New terminologies, as well as the old terminologies are part and parcel of this journey. So what are the COVID-19 vaccines available currently? What do we have now in Malaysia and what are we getting in the near future? So at the moment, we have the Pfizer, BioNTech, Cominati and CoronaVac go out in the vaccination program. And we are expecting the Oxford AstraZeneca, CanSinos, Sputnik V2. Hence, we still have a lot to work on with regards to the guideline on the use of each vaccine. So what to expect after vaccination? The aim of COVID-19 vaccination is to produce adequate protective neutralizing antibody as well as T cell responses toward COVID-19. We always tell our patients that it takes time for our body to build protection after any vaccination. People are considered fully vaccinated or expected to have immunity after their second shot of COVID-19 vaccine or two weeks after the single dose COVID-19 vaccine. What to expect or what may happen in between the inoculation with the needle and the end point of adequate immune response elicitation. First, we look at the statistic. In the United States, in the first six weeks when COVID-19 vaccine rolled out, more than 9,000 of reports were received by the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System out of nearly 22 doses of mRNA vaccine. Of these, 45 reports per million doses administered were serious. In United Kingdom, in the first four months of COVID-19 vaccination program, where more than 41 million doses vaccines were administered, the reported rate, reaction rate to the UK medicine and healthcare products regulatory agency were more than 8,000 for Pfizer and 23,000 for AstraZeneca per million doses administered. In Hong Kong, where Pfizer and Sinovac are used, the reporting rate of adverse event following immunization was comparable for both types of vaccines at less than 0.5%. So what are these reactions? First, we look at the immunization stress-related responses, which are psychogenic responses. Individuals with high levels of fear about injections may develop muscle vagor reaction or panic even before inoculation of vaccine. Psychogenic responses occur very fast, usually before and within 30 minutes of inoculation. They do not last long and have spontaneous recovery. These reactions are not allergic in nature. So Dr. Su will later show you the differences between anaphylaxis and ISRR. Interestingly, the data from UK show that the ISRR were higher among those who received AstraZeneca vaccine. Vaccines rarely cause immediate hypersensitivity reaction. The Gell and Coombs classification is no stranger to us. Based on this classification, which is almost 60 years old, an immediate reaction refers to IgE-mediated reaction, which include anaphylaxis, angioedema, hives, which usually occur within minutes, up to several hours of vaccination in person with an allergy to a vaccine component. However, the gel and comb scheme has several limitations, as many reactions have mixed pathomechanisms, which are much more complex and complicated. It is especially true for immediate reactions. Not all immediate reactions are due to the presence of allergen-specific IgE in the blood, which means the commercially available IgE test could be negative in these reactions. So essentially, immediate reactions are the business of mast cells. Mast cells originate from the circulating basophils. Once basophils enter the tissue, they become mast cells and they are, all, they are in all the organs of the body. As shown here, many factors can degranulate mast cells, which include the IgE, codeine like morphine, the anaphylactoid complement C5A, allergen itself, etc., etc. For drug-induced or vaccine-induced immediate reaction, apart from IgE, anti-vaccine IgG or IgM with complement activation have been described to result in mast cell degranulations, known as CARPA, the complement activation-related pseudo-allergy. 
Many mediators will be released from the mast cells as shown in this picture. Once it granulates, it, it will that include the good old anti, uh, the good old histamines, various types of proteases, heparin, cytokines, prostaglandin D2, various leukotrients, etc. These mediators are important in the symptoms development as they cause vasodilatation, pruritus, edema, and inflammatory cells infiltrations. So these are what the patients present to us with, view and angioedema. In wheels, individual lesions come and go rapidly within 24 hours, whereas angioedema involves deep swelling of the skin or mucosa and may cause mouth pain and can last for two to three days, even with antihistamines. What are the rates of immediate reactions to COVID-19 vaccines? Data from the US CDC during the first two weeks of pfizer BioNTech vaccination in the States show that they encounter about 44 cases of non-anaphylaxis allergic reaction per million doses. These reactions presented as pruritus, rash, itchy and scratchy throat, and mild respiratory symptoms. In the UK, the four-month vaccination report showed that the rate was between 5.5 cases to 200 cases per million doses, with pruritus being the most common symptoms reported. Again, AstraZeneca reported more immediate reactions than the Pfizer BioNTech. Anaphylaxis is more than just angioedema and involves massive mast cells degranulation at the skin and other organs. This will be elaborated further by Dr. Su. Here, I would like to draw your attention the reported rate of anaphylaxis of the vaccines rollout since December last year. US CDC reported 4.7 cases of anaphylaxis per million doses of community given. 66% had no documented history of anaphylaxis in the past. No, de no death was recorded. In another prospective cohort of healthcare employees in the United States, 98% did not have any symptoms of, a, of an allergic reaction after receiving mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. Anaphylaxis occurred at a rate of about 2.5 per 10,000 doses, which is much higher than the CDC report. All of them recovered. Again, majority of them do not have any history of anaphylaxis in the past. In addition, it is estimated 4,000 individuals in the same cohort with severe food and medication allergy histories were safely vaccinated. So in UK MHRA, 15 cases of anaphylaxis or anaphylactoid reaction per million community were reported. Again, no death. AstraZeneca vaccine, however, reported 23 cases of anaphylaxis per million doses with one death so far. Ministry of Health in Japan, interestingly, reported a higher numbers of anaphylaxis with community vaccine at 45 cases per million doses. At the moment, official anaphylaxis rate for Sinovac is not available yet. After the time frame of immediate allergic reactions, reactogenicity of the vaccine is expected to happen. Reactogenicity symptoms are an outworking of the expected immune re reaction that occurs in response to vaccination. The vaccine antigen induces innate as well as adaptive immune response. The main local and peripheral circulating immune cells that are involved in the task force are neutrophils, monocytes and macrophages, as well as resident stroma cells. This will result in the synthesis of release of pyrogenic cytokines, which include the famous interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, and prostaglandin. Crosstalks between the cells occur when more immune cells are also recruited and orchestrate the entire immune responses. It will lead to the development of signs and symptoms of injection site inflammation, as well as systemic effects, such as fever, fatigue, and headache, and some rash. The reactogenicity profile of a vaccine can vary significantly in between individuals. These events are generally milder and reported less frequently in older adults. Localized reactions include pain, redness, swelling, and itch, and it occurs nearly 70% of community recipients. 
In addition, nearly 50% of the vaccine reported systemic reactions as shown here, and the rate increased in second dose. Interestingly, about 1% reported some rash outside the injection site. So as a dermatologist, I am particularly concerned about the skin manifestations during the reactogenicity of the vaccines. In the United States-based COVID-19 International Dermatology Registry, the rash that developed during the reactogenicity of vaccine included urticaria, angioedema, mobiliform eruptions, erythromyalgia, which is burning, erythema and swelling of the hands, vesicular lesions, perineal or chilblain, or flaring of existing dermatologic condition. Some of these eruptions mimic the way our body reacts to the COVID-19 infection. Interestingly, these reactions occur consistently more commonly with the Moderna. Here, however, I show you the data of Pfizer as we are using it in our country. So I would like to bring your attention also to this delay large local reaction. This has been confirmed non-allergic in nature where patch tests and intradermal tests show negative results. Most recipients experience either no recurrence or milder reaction with the second dose for this large local reaction. So finally, we look at the much rarer type 3 and type 4 allergic reactions following immunization. Type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, which presents as vasculitis, has been reported in Cominati as well as AstraZeneca. The photos I show here are some reports of the appearance of cutaneous vasculitis, uh, presenting as palpable purpura, developed following other vaccines like influenza or pneumococcal. Delay or cellular immune hypersensitivity reactions such as uh, erythema multiforme, Steven Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis, drug reactions eosinophilia with systemic symptoms secondary to vaccines are rare but have been reported in the literature. What about the current COVID-19 vaccines? Erythema multiforme, SJS, TEN, DRESS were reported rarely in the United Kingdom. Here in Malaysia, a report of fixed drug eruption has been uh, uh, come to my attention. There was no severe cutaneous adverse reaction reported here in Malaysia yet. So what could be the possible allergen in the vaccine that contributes to the allergic reaction in immunization? Now let's look at the component of a vaccine. For the complete list of components of various pre-existing vaccine, you can refer to this website of John Hopkins. In addition to the active immunizing antigens, which could be the toxoid, live or kill or inactivated virus, or portion of the virus or viral mRNA, other excipient or additives are also used to support the active agent for their stability, preservation, pharmacokinetics, bio, bioavailability, appearance, and acceptability. Also, the culture media used to cultivate the virus may have traces of allergen in the final products. The excipients are component of almost all vaccines and drugs and could be hidden allergens when they are not correctly declared in the information. So what about COVID-19 vaccines? The BC stable, uh, the busy tables aims to list down all the components of COVID-19 vaccines that are and potentially available in Malaysia. We are still yet to find the full list of components for CanSino. The chemical highlighted in red are the allergen of interest in the hot topic of vaccine anaphylaxis that everyone talks about, the PEG and polysorbate. Here, I would like to highlight polyethylene glycols or macrogols. The large family of PEGs are polyether compounds derived from ethylene oxide. PEGs are widely used as excipient and conjugated pharmaceutical, cosmetics, industrial and food products. Exposure extends from household to perioperative setting and PEGs are common constituents of a variety of products, including wound dressings, Pegylated drugs, hydrogels, as well as tablets, lubricants such as the echocardiogram or ultrasound gel, laxatives, bowel preparation, and dental floss. PEG allergy is very uncommon, as shown in this list, 
despite its widespread use. The overall hypersensitivity rate to PEG is, uh, we can't, uh, we, we don't have the numbers. The majority of reported reactions to PEG in the literature are due to high molecular weight PEGs. The lower molecular weight PEGs found in many household products seems to be less common as a cause of allergic hypersensitivity reactions. So PEG itself has not previously been used in vaccine until today. It is used in Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines as a stabilizer to stabilize the lipid nanoparticle containing the mRNA. Now, polysorbate is structurally similar to PEG with repeating side chains that are derived from ethylene oxide. It is also an excipient in a multitude of medical preparations, for example, vitamin oils, vaccines, and anti-cancer agents, creams, ointments, lotions, and medication tablets. We have listed down them in our guideline for your reference. Otherwise, you can, you can read the article cited here in this slide. At least 70% of injectable biological agents and monoclonal antibody treatments contain a polysorbate, mostly polysorbate AT. Unfortunately, polysorbate and its degradation product are known to be intrinsically anaphylactogenic leading to a possible explanation to anaphylaxis in patients receiving polysorbate containing biologics, vaccines, steroids, and chemotherapeutics. First, those reaction to vaccines containing polysorbates may have occurred because of previous sensitization from polysorbate AT. So in summary, for the currently authorized COVID-19 vaccines, all vectored vaccines, uh, all mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna have PEG. All vectored vaccines like AstraZeneca, Johnson Johnson, and Sputnik have polysorbate 80. All inactivated virus vaccines like Sinovac or Sinopharm have no PEG or polysorbate. So this is the most common questions we hear. If I have allergies, can I receive the COVID-19 vaccine? Someone with history of allergies can definitely receive the vaccines based on the major international guideline US CDC and the UK Green Book. It doesn't matter whether it is an allergy to other medications or to pets or bee stings or venom or food or pollen, they can receive the vaccine. However, patients with uh, this history should be observed for 30 minutes after vaccination rather than the usual 15 minutes. The only contraindication to COVID-19 vaccine are those who have allergy to the first dose of COVID-19 vaccine or they have known hypersensitivity to the vaccine components, which are the PEG and polysorbate, which I have elaborated earlier. People with a contraindication to one type of the currently authorized COVID-19 vaccines, for example, mRNA, have a precaution to the other for example, the vector vaccine. However, because of potential cross-reactive hypersensitivity between the ingredients in mRNA and vector COVID-19 vaccines, consultation with an allergist immunologist should be considered. For your information, in UK and US, they do not have alternative COVID-19 vaccines without both PEG and polysorbate. So in our first phase of our vaccination program with our first vaccination guideline, we excluded those with any history of anaphylaxis and severe allergic reaction to receive COVID-19 vaccines. However, with the green light given by CDC and UK guidelines, and with more safety data available, and most importantly, the data showing us that majority of those who develop anaphylaxis to COVID-19 vaccines have no background of history of anaphylaxis. This is our moving target. Patients with an allergic background can definitely get COVID-19 vaccine. Do not vaccinate in those with severe allergy, anaphylaxis, or Steven Johnson syndrome, PEN, or DRESS after a previous dose of COVID-19 vaccines or any ingredients. Patients with allergic reactions like urticaria occurring within 72 hours after previous COVID-19 vaccines are also contraindicated for the second or subsequent booster dose. Why 72 hours, unlike other international guidelines set at four hours? This is because 
we have encountered cases who develop early career 24 to 48 hours after inoculations and the early career were generalized and persistent and there were skin tested positive to PEG. Here, I would like to acknowledge Institute for Medical Research, IMR, who provided us the full allergy testing support, especially in the preparation of allergens. We have Dr. Faisal here as a panelist. Thank you very much. Uh, you can ask some questions to him. Those who have anaphylaxis to previous vaccine or injectable medicines or substances possibly containing PEG or polysorbate or anaphylaxis to multiple different drug classes or idiopathic anaphylaxis, we may advise them to receive vaccine without PEG or polysorbate, which is CoronaVac. For all currently authorized COVID-19 vaccines, antipyretic or analgesic medications such as paracetamol, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, can be taken for the treatment of post-vaccination local or systemic symptoms if medically appropriate. However, routine prophylactic administration of these medications for the purpose of preventing post-vaccination symptoms is not currently recommended because information of the impact of such use on COVID-19 vaccine-induced antibody responses is not yet available. The effect of paracetamol and ibuprofen has been studied in other vaccines as shown in this table. Their use as prophylaxis is associated with reduced antibody responses to most vaccine antigens. Although the vaccinees, the vaccinees still achieve seroprotective levels of antibodies to all the administered antigens. Well, I'm perfectly okay to use antipyretics when medically indicated. Now, CDC guidelines does not recommend antihistamines prior to COVID-19 vaccination to prevent allergic reactions. It is true that antihistamines do not prevent anaphylaxis and their prophylactic use may mask cutaneous symptoms, which could lead to a delay in the diagnosis and the management of anaphylaxis. But look at the UK Green Book guideline. They allow pre-treatment with antihistamine if the vaccine had cell-limiting early career or early career that resolved with oral antihistamines to previous COVID-19 vaccine. It is also anticipated by other studies that in severely allergic patients, high dose of antihistamines could prevent severe reactions to the vaccines. If the vaccinees have underlying chronic spontaneous early career and allergic rhinitis, which are stable on current dose of any inter antihistamines, please continue them, do not stop them. Otherwise, their symptoms may be precipitated or aggravated by the vaccine. Many international guidelines have earlier emphasized that COVID-19 vaccines are not interchangeable. Both doses of the series should be completed with the same product. So what will happen if one absolutely cannot receive the second dose? There are three possibilities. First, leave it as one dose. This is what has been practiced in Singapore, no alternative yet. Second, to receive a different vaccines, we start all over again for two doses as the vaccine platforms are different. Third, to receive a different vaccine, but a single dose vaccine. Studies are on the way in the States and United Kingdom on the efficacy and safety of mixed product series. So let's wait for the favorable report in the next few months. Again, I must emphasize the pharmacovigilance of the COVID-19 vaccines. It is our duty as healthcare providers to report any adverse events following immunizations. There are many ways to report online or hard copy as detailed in the guideline. And the form we use to report adverse drug reaction can be used to report AEFI. The Special Committee for the COVID-19 Vaccines in our National Pharmaceutical Regulatory Agency, NPRA, meets every month to assess the reports of the AEFI you have submitted. So now I have reached the final and the most awaited part of my talk. What is our local data? How are we different from other countries in terms of adverse events for our COVID-19 vaccination? 
In the first two months of the National COVID-19 Vaccinations Program, which ran from 25th February until 13 April, we inoculated nearly 1 million doses of Cominati vaccine and over 51,000 doses of coronavirus. Our NPRA received 5,418 reports of AEFI submitted through the form I showed you earlier. They are, these are the events which had brought to the attention to healthcare personnel. They account for 0.5% of all inoculations with a total nearly 9,500 reactions observed. Immunization stress-related reactions were the most reported events. Excluding the ISRR, the most common reported symptoms are related to the reactogenicity of vaccination, which include injection site pain, myalgia, pyrexia, headache, nausea, etc. Now, using the Brighton collaboration case definition of anaphylaxis, we identify 18 cases of anaphylaxis, 17 due to Cominati, and one was due to coronavirus. This put us at a rate of about 17 cases per million doses, which is very similar to the UK data I presented earlier. Interestingly, many of our healthcare workers face great challenges on how to differentiate immunization stress-related reactions from anaphylaxis. This is because we observe anaphylaxis treatment was administered to those with the psychogenic responses. So in view of this, please stay tuned to Dr. Su's lecture, which is coming after this, for more information on this issue. Now, in addition, our vaccine recipients can report their post-vaccination symptoms using the familiar MySagetural application. There are advantages about this reporting system, but interpretation has to be very careful. The unique part of this adverse reporting is that the vaccinee could report late reactions, which are likely manageable by them. Therefore, we can capture more milder reactions. The vaccinee can also submit their responses as many times as they want when new symptoms arise. This issue with this, the issue with this is that the new responses will not override their previous responses. Hence, there are some limitations of this reporting system and need to be highlighted. The results of this report must be analyzed and interpreted carefully. The report may not re reflect the true incidence of individual reactions. The time to onset of symptoms and causal relationship cannot be accurately determined. The denominator of, for the calculation is different and it was based on those who responded in the MySagetural applications. So here, during the period between 6 March to 29 March, NPRA received a total of 15,000 over responses through MySagetural. These self-reported adverse events are mostly reactogenicity symptoms. And this platform is likened to the VSAFE in the United States and the comparison is as shown here. So we still have much to learn about how these vaccines mobilize the immune responses, as well as the rate of allergy. Nevertheless, no, aller no allergy sufferers should be deprived from COVID-19 vaccinations without sufficient reason, except for a very small portion of allergic persons with the defined contraindication or from the defined risk groups which is the suspected PEG or polysorbate allergy, allergic patient person can receive COVID-19 vaccination. Anaphylaxis can occur even without known allergies. People who have an anaphylactic reaction following the first dose of COVID-19 vaccine should not receive the second dose of the same vaccine. Studies are underway to assess whether COVID-19 vaccines using a different platform can be used interchangeably in the dosing schedule. Recommendation may be updated as further information become available and every one of us is resp responsible to report any adverse event following immunization with COVID-19 vaccines for our database, regulatory action and policy implementation. With that, I thank you. Sorry, thank you, Dr. Tang, for the insightful presentation. 
um, I'm sure you will have questions. So if you have, please type your questions in the Slido and we will answer the question after Dr. Su has given his presentation. So let's move on to our second speaker. Our second speaker, uh, Dr. Su Kok Fong, is an emergency medicine physician working in Sungai Bulo. He has special interest in disaster management and advanced life support in various situations, including aquatic life support. He is also a facilitator for basic point of care ultrasound and facilitated uh, numerous emergency medicine workshops in district and state level. So I would like to invite Dr. Shu, uh, Dr. Su to share his presentation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> All right. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm Dr. Su Kofong, an emergency physician from Hospital Sukhoi Bulo. Uh, today, I will be mainly uh, sharing about uh, how to recognize anaphylaxis and management of anaphylaxis post-vaccination. Okay. Uh, these are my content of my presentation. I will be discussing on how to recognize anaphylaxis, but the, how to differentiate the differential diagnosis and how to prepare vaccination center for any possible anaphylaxis post-vaccination and the management of it. In the past, there have been many literature uh, trying to define anaphylaxis and so far there haven't been any as universally accepted uh, definition. However, in 2020, the World Anaphylaxis Organization has defined anaphylaxis as a serious systemic hypersensitivity reaction, which usually occur in rapid onset and may cause death. In its severe form, this can present as a life, possible life-threatening compromise in AV, breathing, circulation, even without the skin features or circulatory shock. Fortunately, the incidence of post uh, and uh, vaccination anaphylaxis is uncommon. Uh, various uh, literatures has published uh, different uh, incidence rate for different uh, vaccines available. However, in general, it is acceptable that uh, the rate varies between one in 100,000 doses to one in one million doses administered in general. So it is rather uncommon. When someone presents with anaphylaxis, they may experience symptoms pertaining to respirations, such as complaint of foreign body sensations, having stridal, voice hoarseness, wheezing, chest tightness, or breathlessness. And when cardiovascular is compromised, patients may present with uh, syncope, dizziness, palpitations, tachycardia, and when they have shock, they may present with hypotension, prolonged CRT, and even cardiac arrest. Some patients may experience severe abdominal cramp, vomiting, and diarrhea, and this may cause confusions uh, pertaining to GI pathology. Patients may also present with periorbital swelling, lips, tongues, swelling, and also skin rashes, itchiness, or urticaria. Because of the varieties in the presentations of the patients, uh, WAO in 2020 has uh, come up with a diagnostic criteria to help clinicians to uh, identify uh, anaphylaxis so that uh, timely treatment can be delivered to patients. So in the criteria, anaphylaxis is uh, highly likely when one of these criteria is fulfilled. So the first criteria will be when the patients present with skin or mucosa presentations such as uh, itchiness, flush, uh, and swelling over the tongue, lips, and uvula. And when this combined with other uh, system involved, example, AV system, circulations, or gastrointestinal systems, this is likely to be anaphylaxis. In the second criteria, uh, patients does not need to present with any skin involvement. 
So when the patient has exposed to a known or highly probable allergen presenting with an acute onset of hypotension or bronchospasm or laryngeal involvement such as stridal, hoarseness of voice or adenophagia, uh, patients is likely to have anaphylaxis as well. So this criteria is designed to help clinicians to recognize early uh, anaphylaxis so that they can treat it early. There are a few uh, scenarios where we might have uh, difficulties to identify and we cause diagnostic dilemma, especially after post-vaccinations. The, the conditions will be such as mesovagal and panic attack, which Dr. Tang has mentioned earlier. So how do we differentiate it? Usually, uh, most cases like 75 to 80% of the anaphylaxis post-vaccinations occur within 15 minutes after the injections. Whereas vasovagal can occur during the vaccinations or slightly after the vaccinations. Anaphylaxis may present with cough, wheeze, hoarseness of voice, breathlessness if the respiratory system is involved. Whereas in the vasovagal uh, reactions, those features may not be present. Both anaphylaxis and vasovagal may present with syncopal and also hypotension. However, the syncopal attack and hypotensions in the vasovagal reactions tend to be transient, whereas anaphylaxis tend to be persistent and requiring treatments such as IV fluid and also IM adrenaline. In vasovagal reactions, because of the dominance of vasovagal uh, stimulations, patients may present with bradycardia whereas anaphylaxis tend to present with tachycardia. When patients present with panic attack, these pati patients can uh, experience it even before the, the uh, injections. They may present complaint of palpitation even the, before the uh, vaccinations. So this attack can occur before, during, or after immunizations. Patients may complain breathlessness similar to anaphylaxis, but to differentiate this, it, clinicians need to apply uh, more clinical judgments on leads, such as uh, examinations, examining the patients. This kind of patients usually devoid of hoarseness of voice, uh, lungs are clear, no wrong eye. So uh, when further assessment is done, patients usually present with uh, hyperventilations and complain of breathlessness, but uh, normal chest findings. They may also experience tachycardia and palpitation similar to anaphylaxis and may have syncope as well. Next, I would like to move on to uh, how to prepare vaccination center for uh, anaphylaxis post-vaccinations. Actually, design uh, preparing for anaphylaxis in the vaccination center depends mainly on resources that is available uh, in terms of human resource, technical support, and also equipment. So to start off with, uh, it requires planning. So uh, we have to survey and understand the floor plan and where and to locate our observations and treatment areas and how to uh, make sure the patients are separate the patients from uh, the, I mean, the affected patients from the, observe, uh, from the community to pre prevent panics. So staff has to undergo training as well. Usually, uh, most of the staff should ideally be equipped with basic life support. And staff working uh, in the vaccination center should be able to recognize uh, anaphylaxis and know the basic management of anaphylaxis. This can be done by putting up poster uh, at the vaccination center so that they are uh, aware about anaphylaxis as well. When de uh, designing observation and also treatment area, there should be a dedicated area to treat this patient. The patients should be put in the area where it's uh, away from the uh, public uh, and uh, has good lighting and equipment around it. So, we also have to make sure in the vaccination center has enough uh, personnel to work around. 
and like I've mentioned, they are able to administer IM adrenaline and recognize anaphylaxis. Equipment also need to be accessible and uh, available in the vaccination center. For example, drugs uh, pertaining to uh, treatment of anaphylaxis will be the most important is adrenaline. Then also salbutamol, MDI, IV fluid, and the rest of will be adjunctive treatments such as hydrocot, prenitidine, and also the chlorpheniramine. Other equipment which will be available should be available uh, such as uh, equipment uh, such as wheelchair, stretcher, uh, oxygen tank, uh, and so on. Next, also we have to have a con uh, written contingency plan in case some it may unexpected medical emergency happen during vaccination. So this is important because we need to have all the staff in the vaccination center to be aware of their respective role and what they need to do if uh, anaphylaxis uh, happen in among the vaccinees. For example, if uh, there is a patient who has deteriorated, uh, the floor manager should be aware about uh, his or her role and they can start to carry out the contingency plan uh, by uh, distributing or reassigning the job and probably consider slowing down or stopping the vaccinations procedure. And because we do not want to cause panic uh, during the vaccination procedure, so uh, we should have a system to alert the staff uh, if there's an unexpected event happened, but not to make the public panic. So for uh, this uh, can be implemented by having a uh, system such as Bell and all that to increase the situation awareness for the staff. Also uh, in the vaccination center, we have to arrange and uh, make sure there's a easy access for ambulance or transfer. And once all this has been set up, uh, we have to plan for testing to identify the strength and weakness of the system available. And to maintain the efficiency of the system, checklists uh, should be done uh, so that every day there will be a team to go through the list, for example, checking the resuscitation trolley, uh, medication, and also equipment and functionality of that. Okay, this is an example of a floor plan uh, of the uh, vaccination center. Uh, just an example. Okay, so as you can see, the patient will start at the area number one, which is a vaccination center. And then we move on in, and move into the building whereby they will be counseled and also getting consent for vaccination at the counter three and four, and finally receive vaccination at number five. After vaccination, this patient will proceed to the vaccination, to the observation area and exit from the, uh, and exit door uh, at the bottom of the floor plan. Where, uh, if they develop anaphylaxis, they should be bring to the uh, area seven, which is the resuscitation bay. And this area will be separated from the observation area so that the public will not be panicking. And because this area is isolated from the other counter, so there should be a system to alert all the staff around the uh, vaccination center so that they know uh, when to give help when needed. So this is the list of equipment and medication which I have mentioned. Uh, just to note, actually in this list, we have oxygen uh, tank and oxygen requirement in this list. However, in the recent uh, Australia and New Zealand guideline, oxygen requirement has been removed from the out of hospital vaccination center. However, in the, our opinion, uh, if the, the vaccination center has the resource uh, to provide oxygenations, then uh, ideally there should be an, have an oxygen around. When uh, we implement a uh, vaccination center uh, to cater for the anaphylaxis, there should be always a cycle to check the efficiency. So we should carry out this system, plan, do, check, and act. By planning and um, doing the vaccination, uh, we will identify what are the problems and do by checking it using drill and also getting feedback from the staff, we can uh, act and implement uh, improvement. 
to the system and how we respond to uh, anaphylaxis. So as the times go, because the uh, vaccination procedure process for the community will be a long time. So as this goes, and if we implement this PDCA cycle, our response and ability to, uh, to recognize and treat anaphylaxis will improve as it goes. Okay, now let's look at the overview management for anaphylaxis. If uh, anaphylaxis is recognized in the vaccination area, the immediate action we should be get the help and so lie the patients with uh, uh, supine positions and leg elevated. Note that the first medications to be administered should be intramuscular adrenaline, 0.5 mg, and this should be given at the anterior lateral thigh area. And it should be delivered every five minutes up to three doses. Oxygen supplement can be administered to the patients. And if the bronchospasm is persistent, despite on the IM adrenaline given, we can consider giving MDI subutamol. In the case of refractory anaphylaxis, for example, worsening uh, breath uh, symptoms despite on, after giving three IM adrenaline, reassess the AV, breathing, and circulation. Patient may benefit from further IV fluid policies, and we should start IV insulin infusion at this time. I will explain more about the adrenaline infusion in a while. And just to highlight, in the hospital setting, which has a IV glucagon, uh, this can be considered to be given for patients with beta block, who are on beta blocker and experiencing refractory anaphylaxis despite on IV adrenaline infusion. So to prepare for adrenaline infusions, uh, the patient should be on cardiac monitor uh, and also SP2 monitoring and regular BP monitoring. This adrenaline infusion I should be started by experienced personnel or with the guidance of a specialist. To, die, to prepare it and deliver it, Ideally, it should be uh, delivered using infusion pump. Uh, in this, I think most of the healthcare staff will be available. I will be familiar with this if infusion pump is available. So we dilute 3 mg of adrenaline in a 50 cc uh, syringe, dilute in normal line, and deliver it at a dose of 0 0.1 mic per kg per minute and can slowly titrate up to the effect. How about when no infusion pump is available at your center? So we can do it by taking a one pint of normal saline and take a one MP of adrenaline, uh, deliver half of it. So 0 0.5 mg adrenaline in 500 ml of normal saline. So we can run it uh, slowly at two ml or two drops per minute and then slowly increasing it to the effect, but not more than 10 ml per minute. And of course, once we have started the infusion, uh, try to... Uh, reassess the patients and titrate to the effect and consider tapering it down if once the anaphylaxis has resolved. So this is a flow chart of the um, overview management of anaphylaxis, uh, which we have put out in the guideline. Uh, just to highlight that, uh, antihistamines and glucocorticoids such as hydrocot are not the primary treatment here. IM adrenalines will still be the first line of treatment. And as you see the flow chart, uh, renitidine and uh, piriton and also uh, hydrocot are the medications which is uh, at the lower part. So it's not the uh, primary treatment during anaphylaxis. So do not delay IM adrenaline for these treatments. So this, the next flow chart that I'm showing now is uh, the suggested flow chart for anaphylaxis management out of hospital setting. So if this occurs in the uh, vaccination center outside of the hospital, uh, call for help once has identified uh, anaphylaxis. Assess the ABC, lift the leg up with patient lying down. In the case that patients cannot tolerate because of breathlessness, allow them to sit at the comfortable positions. Establish airway and give oxygen if needed. Then put patient on cardiac monitor, pulse oximetry and BP monitoring. 
as we say, the first treatment is still IM adrenaline, 0.5 mg at the mid-lateral thigh. And if with IM adrenaline, patients improve, then try to assess, establish an IV assess, and then uh, refer to the emergency physicians or consult family medicine and arrange for transfer, put on the maintenance trip. If with IM adrenaline, patients has deteriorations or not resolved symptoms, cause, uh, to repeat the IM adrenaline every five minutes, up to three doses, get an IV assess, run IV boluses, one, one to two pint of normal saline. In the case that got persistent bronchospasm despite on IM adrenaline, consider to start MDI sabutamol. And if this still persists, this uh, I did, uh, we should consider the patient is in refractory anaphylaxis. So we should expedite transfer to the emergency department, consult with family medicine specialists or emergency physicians. And uh, while arranging for transfer, we can consider adjunct therapies, but do not delay transfer because of adjunct therapies. Okay. So what are the pitfall, uh, common pitfall in anaphylaxis management? First, uh, because of the over-reliance of the uh, mucocutaneous sign to diagnose it, or because uh, we are waiting for two systems to involve before we diagnose it. So this will cause a failure to administer adrenaline despite patient has a clear uh, anaphylaxis in front of us. So my advice is uh, assess the patient clinically and also use the uh, diagnostic criteria to aid our clinical judgment. Also, the once uh, there are incidents where adrenaline is delayed from being given because uh, clinicians tend to depend on antihistamine and rely on glucocorticoid first. So my take-home message will be uh, anaphylaxis is a clinical diagnosis and IM adrenaline is the first line of treatment. And when we are setting up a vaccination center to prepare for anaphylaxis, always anticipate for the worst and do the best preparation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Su, for your uh, presentation. So now uh, we will start the live uh, Q&A session. So please type uh, your questions uh, in Slido and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. So please take note, we will not be addressing any policy related questions as this is beyond the scope of clinical practice. So we have a first question here uh, for Dr. Tang. Have you come across patients concerned with or uh, enlarged lymph nodes or funicles and a few days post vaccination? Were they not noted before vaccination? Okay, um, now enlarged lymph nodes uh, they are, are quite common, which uh, come to our attention, uh, medical healthcare personnel attention. And I have my trainees who have uh, huge lymph nodes a few days after the vaccinations. One is supraclavicular, the other one is axillary, extremely weak and tender. So, uh, but it resolves in uh, two to three days, very fast they resolve and they just need to take a Panadol for it. Now, for uncles, I have not seen, I have not encountered, but uh, according to the UK uh, MHRA reports, they have uh, infections, skin infections after the vaccination, whether it's related or not, uh, we do not know. So for this, yes, uh, we have lymph nodes for post-vaccination. Okay, thank you. Next question. Maybe Dr. Tang, you can answer this as well. No, as I mentioned just now, uh, those with underlying history of allergic rhin uh, rhinitis, dust, cats, uh, is not a risk factor to COVID-19 anaphylaxis. Is that, uh, uh, and many international guidelines has uh, given green light for that. So they can go for vaccines. Okay, um, next question for Dr. Su. Uh, when is IV prednisolone indicated? Dr. Su? All right. Uh, if, if this is pertaining to anaphylaxis, 
uh, then it is indicated uh, after we treat with an, uh, adrenaline uh, and also IV fluid. So uh, the prednisolone and all this, they are considered adjunct. So in the case of anaphylaxis, uh, we should actually start with the uh, IM adrenaline, IV fluid, oxygen, and MDI salbutamol. And lastly, only consider the adjunctive treatment. Uh, that is because uh, prednisolone does usually, they can relieve the symptoms uh, such as a uh, uh, rash and all that, but it doesn't revert the uh, immediate life-threatening uh, conditions. Okay, thank you. So our next question um, is seizure one of community's side effects? We have one case patient has seizure post 20 minutes and TRO pseudo seizure about, but lab tests show everything normal. I think Dr. Tang or Dr. Faisal? I think the seizure related to uh, uh, vaccine. ISSR. Okay. Yeah, ISSR, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I let uh, Faisal answer. Yeah, yeah, because I, I think this one uh, I was uh, presented with uh, one patient from Sabah, I think, uh, with this kind of uh, presentation. Um, and we have actually ruled out that it is actually a seizure uh, secondary to the vaccine. It's, it's uh, actually uh, uh, an ISRR related immunization stress related response to. Uh, um, a related uh, uh, vaccine uh, adverse uh, uh, reaction. Yeah. So I think it, 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 it is a, so, a sort of a pseudo seizure kind, kind of thing. Mm. And anyone else, Dr. Tang or Dr. Su, you want to add anything to this? No. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I agree with uh, Dr. Faiza and in under the uh, the ISRR, we have this, uh, we have uh, this panic or the other responses. Uh, they can have some uh, pseudo seizure like presentation. Yeah, I, I, this one is uh, uh, we tabulated it in our guideline. I think you can see it. Okay, you can read it. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Um... If patient had a history of SJS secondary to serophomy uh, uh, varizola zoster, is the patient contraindicated for vaccine? Okay, no. If you have Steven Johnson syndrome to an identified cause, which is the sephiroxy or the infection, uh, they are not contraindicated for the vaccine because our vaccine does not contain any uh, antibiotics. And they don't, uh, if you read through the, the ingredients properly, there's no antibiotic inside, okay? And these uh, mRNA uh, technologies uh, does not require any culture, so they, you won't have any eggs, uh, eggs uh, or, or any culture media there. And they, they didn't use latex in their vaccine bottle, and then uh, so you don't need to worry if you are allergic to latex. Okay, okay thank you. Um, there's another question here. May I know what is the procedure required to do if there is an investigation being carried out for death linked to COVID-19 vaccination? I think Dr. Su better take this question. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Su. Let me see. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, maybe Dr. Ben, uh, if I may, I'm, uh, I, I'm Dr. Ben, uh, one of the ID physicians from Hospital Sungai Bulo. Yeah, um, so, 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 yes, um, Yep. So if there is any um, death that is uh, uh, linked, actually, initially, when a, when a death occurs, uh, we may not know whether it is 
linked to the to the vaccine, but if it is linked um, uh, uh, chronologically, as in um, if it happened uh, very soon after the vaccine, um, then the, um, uh, uh, whichever um, health facility the person goes to um, uh, will investigate the case, and um, and uh, it will also involve um, uh, doing a post mortem for these patients as well, and then um, further investigations into the, the patient's uh, um, comorbidities or pre-morbidity if the patient had. Uh, so all of this is very important for us to try to reach uh, um, uh, 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 a reason for the death and how and the causality of the death towards the vaccines. Yeah. Um, uh, so because um, we all know that vaccines are new and so far um, uh, it's, it's been seen that um, uh, they are overwhelmingly uh, fairly safe. Okay, but um, I think from a pharmacovigilance point of view, okay, that means um, um, uh, uh, we keep on being having to be vigilant about what uh, possible side effects could come out from this vaccine. So that requires us to investigate very deeply, not just any death, but any severe side effect that is linked to uh, chronologically to any, any of these vaccines. I, I hope I answered the question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ben. Okay, this question I think is for Dr. Tang. Those who had allergy reaction not supposed to go for second dose, as mentioned in the slide earlier, but in practice, we are asked to refer them. Is that okay? Of course, you can refer to the, the, uh, to the dermatology clinic uh, the, uh, with a dermatologist to assess, okay? So, um, yeah, so they are well informed. They are well informed how to deal with these patients, but from the guideline, we will exclude them from the second dose. Now, so the, the dermatologist is supposed to give some um, advice, as I mentioned, whether to switch to the other brand of the vaccine. So yes, you can refer to the nearest dermatologist, not all to me, not from Sabah, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we have a question uh, regarding a research paper. What is your opinion regarding latest paper released in JAMA uh, regarding association of facial paralysis with mRNA COVID-19 vaccine? Okay, this facial paralysis with uh, uh, mRNA COVID-19 vaccine has been discussed uh, in the last, uh, last uh, webinar, which is last week uh, by a neurologist. So I think you can refer back to the uh, video and then uh, I'll go through again. Yeah. Thank you. So if patients who have household allergy to peg in household products like hair dye with immediate reaction of angioedema palpitations, can they receive the mRNA vaccine? This no. is from Dr. Yu. Yeah, the answer yeah. is no. 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 You can, uh, for, <laughs> for, for an uh, easier uh, recommendation, you, uh, you can recommend the patient for CoronaVac. Or if a patient uh, wish to get uh, mRNA vaccine, you can refer to us uh, for testing first. So, of course, they have to travel to KL uh, to be tested. It's not easy to do a skin test. Maybe Pfizer can comment that. Yeah, because if, if you are suspected with PEG uh, allergy, uh, it depends on the uh, onset as well in terms of when you had that reaction. Let's say, for instance, if the uh, first uh, dose is uh, such and such date, we have to wait at least about four weeks, uh, four to six weeks uh, to actually test for the uh, PEG. And uh, I have to emphasize that uh, uh, the gold standard is actually to test with the vaccine itself, not just PEG. But we don't have the PEG uh, in, uh, we cannot buy the, the PEG. In. So, so what we are doing, 
doing right now is we use a uh, macro gall from the bowel prep. And then we, we actually prepare it in the lab to make it sterile. And then we test it uh, for our weight skin testing. Uh, and, and there's two types of uh, two molecular weights of uh, uh, PEGs that we test because the PEG in, in um, uh, the COVID vaccine is a PEG 2000. The macro goal that we use is PEG 4000 and the molecular weight is actually has a bearing on the um, allergic reaction. So we use 400 and 4000. So it's a lower molecular weight and a higher molecular weight to actually to, to be very sure that it's actually PEG or not PEG. And then after that, we actually, uh, if the skin test is, is negative, because uh, mind you that uh, skin testing is just a surrogate testing, we actually uh, do a subcutaneous uh, challenge uh, to the uh, PG itself, graded graded uh, subcutaneous challenge uh, to see whether the, the, the patient is tr uh, truly negative towards the PG. So when this has been uh, uh, confirmed uh, negative, then we will uh, write down uh, and, and uh, we uh, recommend that this the patient is actually at a lower uh, low risk of a uh, COVID nineteen vaccine, yeah, or well, mRNA vaccine, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, this. Oh, when is the last duration post vaccine vaccination anaphylaxis that may occur? Is it within thirty minutes only? Maybe Doctor Su. Uh. It is not within 30 minutes. Most of the cases will be within 15 to 30 minutes, but we have incidents which has last up to several hours. Thank you. Hope that answers the question. I think we have one more question, um, which is, can I reaffirm even in epilepsy, a patient, a seizure type episode will be considered ISRR? Could it not be breakthrough seizure? I see. So the question is the patient has an underlying epilepsy. So if there's an underlying epilepsy, there is maybe a, a, a breakthrough seizure. Tang, what do you think? Yes, uh, this patient need to be assessed. It need to be assessed by a neurologist, mm. And then uh, to determine a causal relationship. Okay, we... Also recently received uh, a report that a patient developed uh, seizures right after Corona, right? But after uh, more, uh, more history taking examination uh, is found that this patient did not take the anti-epileptic. So uh, this is the seizure because of poor co compliance to the medications. So of course, uh, uh, if, uh, if the pre-vaccination assessment is done correctly, I think uh, we, we shouldn't have a seizure, a breakthrough seizure in the epilepsy patient who are not compliant to the medications. So, so yep, far agreed. after this, yeah. So if you have uh, other patients who have epilepsy and then uh, with un which is controlled with the medications, we think you need the uh, neurologist assessment. Yeah. Thank you. I think now it's just another few more questions have come up. Um, can, we, can we offer CoronaVac instead of skin testing for those with suspected allergy to PEG? Yes, definitely. Uh, the, the alternative is to give yes, CoronaVac. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Hi, doctor. I am one of the vaccine receiver, and apparently I develop anaphylaxis like SOB, larium, adeno, edema, sorry, and turns out no proper guidelines have been taught to us in KKM. I think it was just a comment. Um, if post-vaccination may occur up to several hours post-vaccination, what is your recommendation to monitor these patients? Will they have any prior symptoms? I think it's Dr. Su. Okay. Uh, I think the current guideline, if the patient is of low risk, uh, no history of allergy, 
the guideline recommended 15 minutes of uh, uh, observations. In the case that got a higher risk of uh, uh, anaphylaxis, the recommendation would be 30 minutes. Actually, this duration has been uh, set because uh, most of the anaphylaxis occur within 15 to 30 minutes of the uh, injections. So in the case, if they occur after the 30 minutes durations, uh, incidence is not uh, many. It's same as any other conditions. When we receive a, a medications, there's a risk of getting allergy or anaphylaxis. So uh, this we, we, we can actually uh, allow this patient home and also just monitor up to the recommendation by the guideline. If they develop symptoms, uh, there's, a, there's a vaccination card whereby it's stated clearly what symptoms to monitor. And if they, de they have it, they will come to the emergency treatment for emergency treatment. Okay. I think, uh, we'll, another one, uh, if a patient comes and claims history of anaphylaxis without any available medical records, can we offer the vaccine in the hospital set setting instead? Yes, the guidelines say uh, if you have idiopathic uh, anaphylaxis, you can uh, please refer to the hospital setting. We can uh, uh, dig more history from there and then do the necessary. Okay, thank you. I think a last question, uh, then we can wrap up for today. Can a person with allergy to paracet uh, paracetamol but unsure brand receive a Pfizer vaccine? A certain paracetamol has pegged as one of the ingredients. Pfizer, can you answer? Oh, this is the difficult one because I think this one, if let's say this patient has allergy to uh, hypersensitivity to PCM, then I uh, would suggest to be uh, tested first because uh, most of, uh, of the available PCM in Malaysia, I don't think they has uh, uh, EG coated with it. Because, uh, most of the EG coating for tablets or oral medication is usually the extended release uh, medications. Then they have a uh, polysorbate or or PEG for for stabilizing the uh, the medication. But if let's say you suspect that is a PEG coated uh, medication, like may maybe the patient took it took the uh, paracetamol from overseas, then uh, all uh, by all means uh, get tested and we can test uh, for the PEG uh, uh, testing uh, and also challenge with the uh, uh, NSAIDs because uh, for the paracetamol, it is actually uh, the um, classified as uh, NSAIDs hypersensitivity in our guideline. Is part of the NSAID hypersensitivity because uh, if you have a uh, cross uh, intolerant reaction, then uh, they may have a history of other uh, NSAID uh, hypersensitivity. Mm. We have to ask that as well, not just paracetamol alone, uh, whether they have a, a hypersensitivity to other uh, NSAIDs, uh, and uh, you go from there. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe, maybe we'll just take another two more questions before we round up. Um, so if a patient received mRNA or adenovirus vaccine and developed anaphylaxis, severe reaction, if switched to CoronaVac, how many doses of CoronaVac to be given? I think Dr. Tang, you already mentioned this in your talk. Yeah. I yes. mentioned the talk and uh, can listen again to my talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, studies yeah. are underway. Uh, we hope to get uh, more information uh, in the future, in the very near future, so that uh, we are confidently uh, practicing this. Okay. Okay, the rest, of, the rest of it, I was looking at it, it's mainly comments. Uh, another, another one, so very similar question. I think um, if having history of other vaccine allergy, we are not supposed to give Sinovac, but how to know if the vaccine contain PEG polysorbate? I, I think this got slightly uh, not true, right? 
maybe Dr. Tang, I think again is in your talk. Yeah, uh, just now in my talk, I have uh, mentioned uh, the list, the list of uh, vaccines that may contain PEG or polysorbate, and it, it also in our guideline. Okay, I also give you a, a website to refer. So yes. uh, previous history of vaccines, a lot of them have uh, polysorbate. So now you uh, in uh, uh, Pfizer, they have PEG. PEG only currently being used for vaccine. Uh, previous vaccine never have PEG. Polysorbate, yes. So if you have uh, influenza uh, vaccine uh, allergy, uh, you are not supposed uh, uh, to receive uh, those uh, with polysorbate uh, vaccine. So of course, if you are in doubt, uh, can always refer to us, uh, Dr. Pfizer or, Dr. or me, then uh, we may actually look through again, all right? And uh, give our uh, necessary advice. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have answered all the questions so far. So uh, just let me give some take home messages. So what is the take home message from uh, this webinar? I think one of the things that we all need to appreciate is our immune system is our friend in most situation. It is a very carefully regulated body system. If something goes wrong with the regulation, the immune system can become a foe like in the case of allergy and anaphylaxis uh, in any, as, and as well as an autoimmune condition. So today we've heard about increasing vaccine-related adverse uh, reactions, and I'm sure all of us are keeping up with the literature. So despite these adverse effects, we, we think there's no doubt that vaccination is beneficial as, uh, and there's more favorable outcome of vaccination. I'm sure all of you agree with that. So let's conclude the session today. Uh, we have had an interesting session. Please join us again next week, same time. For your information, uh, next week's topic is on vaccination in pregnancy and lessons learned from phase one rollout of vaccines. The webinar will be on 5th of May, uh, 2020. It will focus on maternal and child <coughs> outcome of COVID-19 vaccines safety of vaccines in pregnant women and infants and of breastfeeding mothers and the lessons learned from phase one rollout of vaccines. Thank you. I uh, will see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you.